Romanesque in Normandy, which is northern France, and Norman England. Normandy is in northwestern France. And you'll remember that we said that in the Romanesque period, um, much of Europe was ruled by regional rulers. So you would have, in this case, the Duke of Normandy. And the Duke of Normandy is someone who's very, fairly famous in history. Uh, he's known uh, to the English-speaking world as William the Conqueror. And we'll be talking about the Norman Conquest shortly. There are two famous Romanesque churches that were established by William the Conqueror and his wife, Matilda of Flanders, that are located in Cannes in northern France. One is saint Atenier or St. Stephen, uh, also known as the Abbe à Oms, the Abbey of Men. And the other is Santa Trinita, or the Holy Trinity, uh, the Abbey of Women. Now, in your text, they just had uh, Santa Tenier, uh, which is the church at the Abbey of Men. So that is the one we'll be talking about. Um, let me give you a little bit of background on who William was. Um, William, the Duke of Normandy, uh, is also uh, William the Conqueror, or, or William the First of England. Uh, he's also known as William the Bastard. Um, and he was the Duke of Normandy who in 1066 conquered Anglo-Saxon England. He became William the First of England and established Norman rule in England. His detailed census of people and property in his new kingdom became known as the Doomsday Book. And at his death in 1087, William was buried at this church, saint Atenier, in Cannes. Uh, the church was built uh, 1064 to 1077. Um, and the earliest building was uh, the built, the earliest building campaign uh, was from about 1064 to the end of the 11th century. And at that point it had a timber roof. And then from 1115 to 1112, a very important building campaign occurred uh, where you have a nave ceiling is vaulted with masonry and with masonry ribbed vaults. So one of the important things that we'll be seeing about this church is that it is one of the earliest examples of a ribbed vault. And then a little bit later in 1202, the choir was rebuilt. We're starting out looking at the Western facade of the church. Uh, and as you can see, it has uh, a kind of three part uh, division. Both, if you look at the facade, you see these uh, moldings or string courses running uh, partially across right under the windows that divide it vertically. Uh, but also, you have these very large uh, buttresses up against the wall uh, that divide the facade vertically. So you have, right in the center, the largest doorway and then the other two levels have additional windows, three windows each. And then on either side, you have a smaller section corresponding. You have a smaller section corresponding to the side aisle with a smaller entranceway, smaller doorway, and then just uh, one window at each of the other two levels. This is also a two-tower facade. Now, the very tops of the towers, those uh, pointed spires, those are Gothic. Those are added a bit later. Uh, so here we see the introduction of a three-part, two-tower facade. And these characteristics are some that will eventually influence uh, the development of the Gothic church. Um, if you think of uh, Notre Dame uh, du Paris, which we'll see later, of course, uh, it has a two-tower facade. Now, even though some of the elements influence the Gothic. That doesn't mean it's Gothic. It's Romanesque, and you can tell that very easily when you look at you look at how heavy those walls are, and uh, how much wall space there is. 
and how small the windows are in relationship uh, to the wall. So you have uh, the articulation of parts. It's very clearly uh, divided into these different sections. Uh, you have the emphasis on the wall. And uh, you have uh, some horizontal elements, as you said, the, uh, the moldings running across, um, as well as the vertical, very huge buttresses. When we look inside, we see a three-part elevation and that means that when we look at the wall of the nave, the large central hallway, when we look at the wall, we see at the bottom the arcade level, and then a gallery level, and then above a Claire story. And you'll find that although there are certainly variations in Romanesque churches, many, many of them uh, do have this uh, elevation with a gallery in the center, um, which is an extra story. It's uh, people can walk around in it. It's, uh, it's large. And then the uh, Claire Story windows are relatively small to uh, the other uh, levels. Now, the rib vaults, were be, the rib vaults were created um, probably around 1120, 1115 to 1120. And we want to take a closer look at those. Uh, here's a better view of the elevation where you see uh, clearly the arcade, the gallery, and the smaller Claire story above. And you can also see uh, the effect of these ribbed vaults. Now you have a colonnette uh, sort of an engaged column that is uh, tall and thin that rises up from the very floor to the springing of the vault, uh, which here is uh, at the uh, point that, that uh, marks the bottom of the Claire story, or the top of the gallery level, whichever you want to think of it that way. And you can see that there are transverse arches that rise up we want to look closely at the vault. And as you can see, there are the colonnettes that rise up. And from the springing of the colonnettes, there are transverse arches that go directly across the nave and attach to the column or the colonnette on the other side. Uh, these are also called, of course, diaphragm arches. But transverse arch tells what they do. They go across or transverse the nave. And then you see other ribs, other additional sections of molding, uh, of masonry, that go crisscross from one colonnette, one springing of the vault, and you can see there's an extra colonnette there, and it crosses over um, sort of skipping two Claire Story windows or two uh, gallery openings, and then attaches to the colonnette on the other side. And then, of course, it does it the other way. So it looks like when you're looking directly at it, as we are in this picture, it looks like a great big X. But you have the transverse arch that goes across one end and then across the center of that X and then across the other end and that makes a bay. And as you'll notice, within one bay, you have six parts. They look like triangles, only uh, they're concave triangles, if you will. Uh, and so this is a sexpartite ribbed vault, or a six-part ribbed vault. And as we said, this is one of the earliest ribbed vaults uh, that exists. Now, there's three um, churches that we're going to look at that are considered to be early ribbed vaults, and they can vie for who one, which one, and they can vie for which one is the earliest. Um, but those are, as you see here, San Atelier at Cannes, uh, Durham Cathedral in England, uh, and San Ambrogio in Italy. So be aware as we look at those uh, that we're looking at some of the early examples of ribbed vaults. 
And they're early because they're early 11th century. They are still in the Romanesque period. But of course, they also are going to be extremely influential on the development of the Gothic uh, style that comes uh, a bit later. It begins around 1140. Uh, in this image, you can also see the small clerestory window. That the galleries, the arcades are much larger. And the fact that you have this small Claire story, of course, does once again indicate that you're, you're dealing with a Romanesque church with uh, very, very thick walls um, and very visible walls. Certainly one of the most famous examples of fiber arts or of textile art is the Bayou Tapestry. Now, we don't know the exact date. We know that obviously, you'll see, it has to come after the Norman conquest of England because it tells the story of the Norman conquest of England, which took place in 1066. So uh, it's being dated around 1070 to 1080. It's called the Bayou Tapestry, but it's not really a tapestry. It is uh, embroidery on linen and it's embroidery with wool yarn on a linen background. And here we're seeing a close-up uh, where you can actually see the stitching. Uh, there's two types of stitching. One is known as the outline or stem stitch and that goes around the figures. It literally, as it sounds, outlines all of the forms. Uh, you can see that it makes the uh, circles of the chain mail. Uh, it outlines the figures and the shields in this image. And then within that, uh, to give uh, colored areas, you have what is known as couching or laid work. And essentially you put uh, stitches of the colored yarn across it and then come back and tack it down uh, with stitches running the other way so it forms an area of color. Uh, this textile, uh, the Bayou Tapestry as it's called, is 20 feet high by approximately 230 inches long. Uh, I have 229 feet and eight inches. We don't have all of it. Uh, there is a section at the end that is missing, and we think that that section probably tells the very end of the uh, Norman Conquest when uh, William is going to be uh, crowned King of England. Uh, but that section's missing, and I'm going to show you uh, bits and pieces of it uh, to uh, let you know a little bit about the story that goes on. Um, there are a number of ideas about who may have ordered this work of art. Um, the leading thought uh, is that it was ordered by Odo, the Bishop of Bayeux, and the half-brother of William the Conqueror. Uh, there are some other people that have been suggested, but uh, he seems to be the leading contender. Um, and then one of the questions is, who created the embroidery? Well, there's a lovely legend that Queen Matilda and her ladies embroidered the Bayou Tapestry. However, there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that. What most people believe is that it was created by English embroiderers. It's what they, what is known as the Opus Anglicanum, or English work embroidery. And the English were very, very famous uh, for the high quality of their embroidery. So, anonymous women embroiderers uh, uh, probably were the cr actual creators. Now, the, the textile is a kind of narrative scroll of events. Uh, it is secular in nature. Uh, in other words, it's not telling a religious story about Jesus or the saints. It is telling uh, a story what we would call from history. And the story is about the Norman conquest of England. And it is, of course, from the point of view of the conqueror uh, and uh, tries to support his claim and supports his claim to the crown of England. Within the textile, you have scenes that reveal details about uh, events, uh, details of daily life, 
Uh, it shows the military garb of the time. It shows military techniques of the time. Uh, for example, we've already seen a close-up of some of the chain mail um, and the type of helmets that were worn by the Normans. Uh, we'll see the use of stirrups by the Norman cavalry. And we'll also see uh, the record of an appearance of a comet that today we know it as Halley's Comet. So I'm going to just show you some of the events. Uh, I'm going to skip over some, some of the uh, preliminary events. There's quite a few of them because they're, uh, of course, of great interest to the Normans. Um, but um, let's start off with a picture of King Edward the Confessor, who was the King of England. Uh, and, of course, the problem was that when, Eng when Edward the Confessor died on January 5th, 1066, um, he left no direct heirs, he left no son to succeed him. Now, that might, not have, that might have been a much greater problem uh, to the English at a later period uh, because the Anglo-Saxons did not yet follow the idea of primogenitor. In other words, that the oldest son of the king or of the duke or whatever royal person uh, will succeed him. They actually would have a, a group of uh, noblemen, of counselors, known as the Whitten, that elected the king. And probably very frequently it would be the son, but in this case they elected someone else. And that was Harold Godwinson, the Earl of Essex, who was Edward's brother-in-law and one of his chief advisors. And they unanimously elected Harold. Uh, also, Edward at his death was supposed to have said, into Harold's hands I commit my kingdom. So that seems all very straightforward. Um, who could contest <laughs> the election of the king? Well, several people could. Um, but the person who successfully contested the, uh, the, uh, the election of Edward uh, was the Duke of Normandy. And that is uh, William, uh, known now as the Conqueror. And we're going to see what uh, his claim is based on. Well, part of his claim is based on this idea of a male relative inheriting. Uh, because he was, it was like a, a distant cousin, I'm not sure a second or third cousin, uh, to Edward. And so he is related by blood to Edward. So that's part of his claim. But it's a relatively distant uh, connection. Um, and of course there is what we call the English Channel, or the Narrow Sea, uh, that separates uh, the Kingdom of Normandy, uh, the uh, Duchy of Normandy, uh, from the, King uh, the Kingdom of England. Um, but Edward has some other, uh, another reason that he claims the throne, and we're going to see that as we look at the Bayeux Tapestry. Uh, what we're looking at right now is uh, the uh, embroidery that shows uh, King Edward, uh, you see he's, he's identified, Edward Rex, uh, Edward the King, uh, and he's speaking to two men, uh, one of whom is presumably Harold. Um, he sends them as uh, ambassadors, emissaries, uh, to William of Normandy. And uh, William claims that uh, Edward told him that he was going to be the king. And uh, we'll see a little bit how that plays out. But also, let's look at how this is created. You have your scene uh, sort of, uh, that we're looking at in the center. And then on either side, you have borders. There are other strips of fabric, strips of linen, uh, that have been sewn to it. Uh, in this case, you have little animal designs. And the designs um, are they vary. Uh, sometimes during a battle scene you'll see the dead soldiers uh, lying there. There's one uh, image where uh, someone is actually stripping the chain mail off um, a dead uh, warrior. Um, there's a few places where there's some uh, nude figures uh, which uh, uh, I guess upset the Victorian society. Um, 
But uh, you can also see that Edward is placed in a little architectural setting. Uh, you have towers and an arched window or doorway. Uh, as I was saying, well, he is in his what palace at Westminster, perhaps. Uh, here is a feasting scene, and there's several feasting scenes. One is Harold's feasting scene, which you see here. There's another one later on, uh, which is uh, uh, Williams is feasting. And uh, they are, first, uh, Harold goes uh, with one of his companions to the church, which you see with little crosses on the top. Uh, and they pray for a safe voyage to Normandy. And then they have a farewell feast in uh, Harold, one, of Harold, one of Harold's uh, homes. And you can see Ecclesia, the church is identified, and Hick, and it's cut off on our picture, but it would be Harold. So here is Harold. This is the scene that is very crucial for William's claim to the English throne. Uh, he has uh, the claim of being a blood relative to the former king, uh, William the Confessor, uh, but he's not a close relative. And as we said, primogenitor was not the law of the Anglo-Saxons, although it becomes the law, it is the law of the Normans. But William has another claim. Uh, he says that Harold, while he was in Normandy, swore fealty to William. And the text here does not say exactly what he's swearing on, uh, but it does show Harold swearing on two reliquaries. And perhaps what William thought Harold was swearing was a little different than what Harold thought William was swearing? Who knows? We can't interview either of them right now. Um, but uh, William says that Harold vowed to support him uh, in William's claim to the English throne. Whether that's true or not, it's the assertion of the conqueror. Uh, but there you see it. Uh, there is uh, Harold is swearing. Uh, he, and this would make him an oath breaker if it were true. So here we see Edward the Confessor again, now uh, looking a little more feeble, a little older. And then we see him on his deathbed. And we see him being, as you can see quite clearly, it says defunct, <laughs> defunctus est. Uh, so Edward uh, is, is dead. We see him on the deathbed and then we see him, uh, his body being prepared for burial. You might notice how each little scene is uh, shown with some kind of architectural or, um, in the one case we saw the reliquaries, uh, some, some, something besides just the figures to tell us where it's happening or to place it in a kind of uh, framework uh, that uh, shows us that this is a, a separate scene. And of course, as we said, uh, Harold was elected as the king of the English. And so here we see Harold, this has sometimes been called his coronation scene. Uh, and we see here sits Harold as the king of England. Uh, and you'll notice he's holding the orb and cross. He's holding a very elaborate scepter. He's crowned. Uh, and there is the archbishop, um, Stigant, or Stigant, uh, standing next to him. Now, that's an interesting little detail because the archbishop was deposed. <laughs> so by showing this archbishop so clearly, I think William is probably trying to say that the um, coronation was not valid. Uh, however, other historical records tell us that it was a different archbishop that uh, crowned Harold. So maybe this is a little bit of Norman uh, propaganda there to support William's claim. And here we see the entire scene with the uh, uh, herald in the center, uh, very frontal uh, 
enthroned as king, the archbishop on one side, and uh, uh, two figures, presumably representing crowds of courtiers, uh, on the other side. But things did not go very well for Harold. Um, it was at this time that they saw a comet. And if you look at the scene uh, right above uh, this uh, little, uh, looks like a little domed structure, um, there's this very elaborate star with a uh, fiery tail on it. Uh, and this is the comet that we today call Halley's Comet. And when this comet was seen in the heavens, um, you know, people marveled at it. Uh, and it was seen to be an omen of disaster. And of course, we know uh, that it, uh, Harold's reign um, was cut short by the Norman conquest. Well, the Normans decided they were going to uh, um, conquer England. And so they have to prevail. Pre so they have to prepare, and there are scenes of them preparing for this, including the construction of the Norman ships. Uh, which is another uh, kind of interesting scene of, of uh, shipbuilding here. And then they have their fleet and uh, they are crossing the English Channel. And uh, this is uh, William ship Mora and uh, it's sailing off to England and of course there are other ships that are shown in the uh, tapestry or the textile. And here we have the Norman fleet uh, getting ready to cross the channel and also when they have landed and as you can see they brought their horses so here the horses are being taken off the ships. Now in the meantime Harold has had to uh, repulse another invasion which is uh, the Danes uh, who also claimed the throne uh, but he was able to defeat them but fresh from that battle he's got to transverse his kingdom and uh, come to meet the Normans who are invading um, from, a different, from a different part of the kingdom. The textile does not tell uh, about Harold's difficulties with the Danes. Uh, what it shows right after the Normans land, they have a feast. And so we see them feasting and we also see some scenes of the preparation of the feast which are very interesting for uh, showing activities of daily life. Uh, but here we're focusing on uh, the feast and uh, the, the kind of round table uh, of an ark and uh, you can see the servant kneeling and uh, others bringing the food while the noblemen are feasting. And then we see many scenes of the Battle of Hastings. Um, what we're looking at right now was the Norman cavalry attacking the Anglo-Saxon shield wall. And basically, um, Harold's troops were up on a rise up on a hill, which would usually give them a, an advantage. Uh, but they were on foot. And so what they did was form a shield wall um, with their shields. And as the Normans on horseback rode up the hill, uh, you know, they would defend the hill. Of course, being on horseback is a great advantage uh, because you have a more powerful animal that can just sort of, you know, break through uh, the, uh, the shield wall, can uh, trample on the people if, if it's not killed first. Uh, and there's another device here that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you can see the Norman soldier uh, using stirrups. Uh, stirrups were a great innovation in riding horseback and it was also an important innovation for warfare because without stirrups, if you're trying to throw a spear or hold a lance, uh, you could easily get thrown off. But with stirrups, you have something to balance yourself and to brace yourself uh, so you can much more effectively and strongly uh, throw spears or hold a lance and just simply drive it on through people. Um, so you do see details that actually show the types of helmets they were wearing, uh, the fact that they were wearing chain mail, uh, and uh, this difference in, uh, in the uh, fighting technique of the shield wall versus the cavalry. 
Uh, and here's another example when they have the hill with the Saxon infantry. And as you can see, not every one of the Saxons now has chain mail. So, um, you know, some of the Saxons were fighting without that extra protection, presumably. And the, uh, the Normans are charging the hill. Some of the horses don't make it. You can see one of them falling. Uh, you can see fallen soldiers below. Uh, but you can also see some of the uh, Saxons tumbling down the hill. So this is uh, the height of battle. Here you see the scene of the death of Harold. Um, there's been some discussion about which figure actually is Harold. Uh, you'll notice that there's a, a little arrow uh, that goes up, it looks like toward the nose, <laughs> but uh, presumably toward the eye of uh, one of the standing soldiers. And the word Harold is uh, right at the top of his head. And uh, traditionally, this figure has been seen as Harold. Um, the embroidery that is the arrow, however, is actually uh, more modern. It's a, it's a replacement. Um, but there was something there. They see the stitches. So whether it was a shield, whether it was a spear or an arrow, uh, not quite certain. The story is uh, that Harold was pierced uh, in the eye by the arrow, and this killed him. Uh, some people have suggested that it might not have happened that way. There's other records that suggest, uh, uh, that don't mention that, uh, and they point out that um, an oath breaker was supposed to be put to death with an arrow through his eye. So this may or may not uh, be more Norman propaganda uh, rather than the actual event. But once again, we're not there. We don't know. So now England has been conquered and the Normans are setting up their kingdom in England. And we're going to look at one of the Norman churches of England. In fact, it is the largest, uh, is the most completely preserved uh, Norman church in England. Uh, and this is Durham Cathedral in Durham, England. Um, I found a number of slightly varying dates. It often says it's founded in 1083, but evidently the building began in 1093 uh, and continued until 1133. And then there were some additional building campaigns a bit uh, later. Now, after the Norman conquest of England, English churches were rebuilt or were replaced or sometimes new churches were built in the Norman style with this monumental stonework that we associate with the Romanesque style. And in England, uh, they will talk about the Norman style or about a Norman church. And so what we call the Romanesque period uh, is specifically called Norman. So uh, Norman is English Romanesque. And as you can imagine, they're bringing uh, their building styles from uh, the French continent, from Normandy. So here you're seeing uh, the church rising <laughs> up above the water, up above the river, uh, and the dates. And then, of course, there are parts of it that are a little bit later, the Western Towers, 12th to 13th centuries. Uh, the uh, Crossing Tower is actually 15th century English perpendicular. Uh, and this is considered to be the largest and most complete uh, Norman church in England. Uh, many of the other ones were you know, uh, replaced by Gothic churches later on. Now, when you're looking for plans for Durham Cathedral, you usually will find two plans. And one of them is showing the Norman church that dates from 1093 to 1133. And then uh, some slightly later uh, additions are shown in the other plan. Uh, it has the what they call the Galilee porch in the west, so it's this projection off the west end. And that was a little bit later in the 12th century, about 1170 to 75. And then the east end, where originally you saw a rounded apse, you now see uh, a rectangular or oblong uh, chapel that's called the Chapel of the Nine Altars. 
and that's created in the 13th century. So that's a Gothic chapel at the end. So when we look into the church, you're going to be seeing uh, Gothic windows at the end. And that's very frequent with churches where they rebuild the choir, uh, but leave the Romanesque nave. Here we're looking at from the side. Uh, it's 146 long. Uh, the height of the nave is 73 feet high. Uh, and then uh, the choir is slightly larger. Uh, and then the choir is just slightly taller at 74 feet. Um, but you can see, once again, when we talk about separation into parts, uh, you can see a, a great deal of wall area with windows uh, at uh, the clerestory level at the top, uh, and then a little further down uh, in the side aisle. And you can see the buttresses that uh, give you some vertical um, emphasis, but a lot of horizontal emphasis out of the uh, horizontals of the blind arcades at the lower part and the uh, little string courses and then the row of uh, windows as you go up and of course the, uh, the uh, line of the eaves. And then you can see of course some uh, gothic additions uh, with that uh, large, large window in the transept there. Um, this contains relics of uh, St. Cuthbert of Durham, who was a very famous English, uh, northern English saint. Uh, I should point out that Durham is uh, in the far north of England. And the west end has been blocked off now. So this is the side, the north side, that you would probably enter through to enter the church. When we go into the nave, uh, you're seeing this wonderful example of the Norman or English Romanesque style um, with the three-part elevation with a large arcade, a gallery, and a smaller clair story. Uh, you're also seeing the ribbed vault, which is, of course, extremely important. And let's take a look at the ribbed vault. This is, once again, one of the earliest ribbed vaults in Europe. And it is a septpartite, or seven-part ribbed vault. This is one of the earliest ribbed vaults in Europe. This one is a septpartite, or seven-part ribbed vault. I'm going to show you this first as the image where we're really looking up into the vault, and then I'm going to show it to you on the plan. So as you see here, as you see here, if you look between these wide transverse arches that go across the nave, directly across, uh, and then you have two openings the, uh, of the gallery, and then there's another uh, transverse arch that goes across and within there you have two crisscrosses or two uh, uh, you know, kind of curving X's uh, of the ribs that cross over and if you start counting the sections between the ribs you'll find that there are seven parts between each transverse arch. So this is a seven part ribbed vault uh, and here you can see it again on the plan. Um, you'll notice that you have, uh, at the western end, you have some, uh, just two bays that are four-part rib vault, and then you see these seven-part vaults, which is very unusual. Um, the transverse arches going across between the piers, and then you have another pier, and then you have the transverse arches going across the next, uh, set of piers. So, uh, you then have your, di your diagonal ribs connecting uh, each of the piers, you know, sort of two crisscrosses, but because there is not a transverse arch between every pier, it sort of skips, skips a pair, you have uh, this sort of lozenge shaped in the center, sort of a diamond shaped, and you can count seven parts. Uh, 
six triangular parts and one uh, sort of a diamond shaped in the center. Of course, these are all three-dimensional. Uh, uh, these are not flat triangles as they appear on a plan, but they are, of course, they are groined vaults. Uh, they are um, concave as we would look up at them. And then this is one of the things that is, uh, this is one of the things that's so distinctive about uh, Durham Cathedral and how when you see the uh, picture of the interior, you always know that's Durham. Uh, those are the decorative carvings on these very large piers. Uh, and I want to remind you, uh, when we look at Romanesque churches today, a lot of times they've lost their paint. Uh, they've got, as we said, relatively small windows. So a lot of people sort of think, oh, they're dark and dreary. But no, they wouldn't have been. Remember, originally what they would have been, they would have been painted bright colors. Uh, they would have had uh, lights from the, uh, the lights on the altars, uh, from candles. So it would have been light flickering in the darkness, perhaps. Uh, but there are more light coming in than uh, uh, perhaps earlier churches might have shown, too. So compared to Gothic, yes, they're dark, but they would have been richly ornamented. You would have had beautiful altar cloths, uh, reliquaries uh, with gems. Uh, you would have uh, beautiful, rich paintings. Now, the paint is gone. But we can still see that here they didn't just rely on painting, they also carved the designs into the pier. So these would have been painted, but you could have had the design and now you can sort of, uh, in your imagination, supply very uh, bright colors of paint uh, to these uh, chevron designs, uh, the uh, diamond or lozenge uh, designs. Uh, there's some spirals in there somewhere. Uh, as I say, this is very distinctive of uh, Durham Cathedral. And around the arches, you also have these kind of uh, zigzag uh, decorations that are carved directly into the stone. And this suggests something that seems to be true of uh, many English churches, that the English prefer decoration over clarity of structure. And we'll see this particularly later on in the Gothic when uh, they create these uh, vaults with uh, lots of extra ribs and eventually fan vaulting. So you don't really see the structure of the ceiling, you just see uh, beautiful decoration. But here it's the earlier example in the Romanesque period uh, where you're actually seeing uh, carved designs uh, in the uh, piers of the church. And here you can see this kind of spiral um, design as uh, the lines curve around the pier. And uh, just more details. I'll show you the three-part elevation, show you uh, a part of one of the bays, uh, and looking up. And you can see uh, how very thick the walls are when you look at those Claire stories and how, de you know, how deeply set the windows are.